Praise God. What a glorious hope the Lord's given us. You know, that's not just a fairy tale. That's something that's going to happen. And I, I don't know the dates, but I know the Lord does, and that's in his hands, and that's not something for us to worry about. Praise God. Isn't the Lord good to us? Well, praise the Lord. I, I continue, I guess, uh, as perhaps many do. I think the Lord has caused us recently to focus on, on thoughts respecting what we're about. And, uh, you know, I just continue to have things that the Lord quickens. And so I'm just going to do my best to share some things because I believe God wants us to understand his heart and his purpose and what it is that he is looking for from us and what his vision for his church is. As I've said a number of times recently, we live in a country in particular, certainly a world, but a country in particular where American culture has overrun the church, what is called the church, the church world. It has literally taken the ways of the world, the, entire, the way of thinking of the world, and just infused it into what purports to be God's church. And it's changed it completely. Uh, well, I say completely. You know, you can tar something with a br too broad a brush. But I, I feel like I'm, I, I, what I want to share tonight is two things. Number one, to help us understand the religious climate in which we exist and to understand in contrast what it is that God is looking for from us. And I think it would uh, bring some clarity. I hope it does. But you know, you go back all the way to the beginning and Satan rebelled against God, didn't he? He said, I want to be like the Most High. I'm going to do things my way. Self-will is the way to go. And, of course, we know he led the human family into that. That has characterized human nature ever since. And it seems like when you look at our culture, individualism reigns in our thought pattern. And it's understandable, first of all, human nature. But second of all, you go back into our history and you look at the people who first settled here, apart from the Native Americans, I understand, but uh, you look at the colonists who came. What did they come here for? Well, persecution, wasn't it? It was religious persecution. It was the freedom to worship God, not being constrained by the Church of England or the Church of whatever. It was something that was, that was absolutely saying, you've got to do it our way or no way, and you're going to be persecuted. And they came here wanting freedom. And the uh, folks that put our Constitution together, which is being shredded today, but nonetheless, that's another story. Uh, they enshrined the principle of, of individual liberty and freedom into our Constitution. Well, I th I'm thankful they did. You know, it's not that I'm against that. But the point is that individualism basically is it's about me. My interests, my will, my rights, what I feel, what I want to do, that's paramount. That takes uh, precedence over the group, over the society, over whatever. I'm, I have the right to do as I please. That's the spirit that is a part of the American picture. Now, of course, you go into human society and you see the other side of it. And I'll tell you, when you're talking about just human society, you take God out of the picture for a moment, you've really only got two alternatives, don't you? You have individual self-will or you've got some form of tyranny in which a society, a gang, something controls other people and forces them to do what they want them to do instead of what they feel individually they want to do. You've got this tension in society. Well, I'll tell you, you see this reflected in religion everywhere. And particularly the spirit of individualism has utterly corrupted what God intended his church to be in the beginning. Uh, and you see it in the scriptures, don't you? You think uh, some of you probably have already thought about Deuteronomy chapter 12. And we see just one example of what happens when people imitate the people around them. Because that was the way it was in the heathen culture. In the days of the Israelites, when they were being prepared to go into the land 
to inherit what God had promised. Now the heathens, the heathen nations, the, everyone had their gods. If you were Egyptian, these are your gods. If you were Hittite, these were your gods and so forth. But when it comes to worship, when it came to worship, everybody kind of did what they wanted. They had household gods. They would establish places of special worship where they would offer sacrifices. You hear the expression, high places. They had a special significance in the heathen religion. So if you found a particularly nice hill with a nice tree on it, that was a great place to go and have, you know, practice your private little religion. And so it's in that setting that Moses says this, these are the decrees and laws you must be careful to follow in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess as long as you live in the land. Destroy completely all the places on the high mountains and on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down their idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. God meant business. He's not going to have any other gods before him. But listen to, what, listen to this part. It's not just get rid of the stuff. It's get rid of the way in which the principle of this individual, I'm going to do as I please kind of spirit. Because he says, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way. You see? This is where the spirit of the world just constantly tries to come in and corrupt the way we think. Don't do it that way. But you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. You know, I don't even have that marked, that last little part there. I was sitting in the chair this afternoon trying to look up this scripture again because I thought about it and wanted to refresh my mind. And I didn't happen to have my red pen. You know, I'm, I just don't feel dressed if I don't have my red pen, but I guess that was the case. But anyway, that's significant, folks. God is interested in a dwelling place. He's interested in calling people to his dwelling place. But I'll tell you, you look at the American scene today, and they are doing exactly what God said not to do. It's religion according to me. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to look for what, what is meaningful to me. I am the highest authority in my spiritual life. Now, of course, you know, it was, it was, the point was made well made this morning that, uh, you know, when you kind of approach the things of God and religion, I should say that way, it's very easy to dress it up and make it sound real spiritual. Jesus is leading me. Well, if Jesus is leading everybody that says Jesus is leading me, he is really one confused fellow. Because I'll tell you, you, know, you can find somebody to say, Jesus led me to shoot you. you know, there's, there's all kinds of craziness in the world. But I mean, even in, when people that are sincerely, there's people that are sincerely caught up in a way and imagine that this is an acceptable thing to God for the church to be just, you go here, I go there, I go down the street, I prefer contemporary music. You, can, you prefer this style. You prefer that preacher. You prefer this. And that's fine. You go your way, I go mine. Jesus is cool with that. Oh, my God. Is that what Jesus died to bring about? See, there's something that's happened here. The authority has fallen to the individual. He has become God of his own will, his own way. And, and the devil has found a way to dress that up and make it seem like they're serving God. Oh, God, open our eyes to see the reality. You know, I, uh, I thought of a illustration that may seem humorous, but I'll tell you, it, it really pictures it for me. 
And that's comparing the church or the, the church world with the restaurant business. Now, I know, how many of you got the uh, July 11th on your, marked on your calendar to live around here? There's one. There, there's some more. You know, we're finally going to catch up with all you folks that live near interstates. I guess I left my hand, too. We're finally getting our very own Cracker Barrel. So, praise God, we're, we finally made it. But think about the restaurant business. What is it that drives the restaurant business? You're basically appealing to people's desire for their particular preference in food. Now, you got people that are in their lives in a hurry. They don't care. They're going to run by and, and shove, a, shove a Big Mac down their throat and, and grab a Coca Cola and go on. That's, that's what food is to them. And you got people all over the map who have their particular taste, whether it's fish or, or barbecue or, or uh, you name it, you know, Hungarian or, or, or Polish or what have you. You've got all these cuisines that are designed to appeal to the individual tastes of people. And, of course, you've got, it's not just the food, is it? Uh, you know, we got folks in the restaurant business here. But how would it be if you served your very best food and you set up a table out by the garbage can? That, that wouldn't work too well, would it? You see, it's, the, it's not just the food, it's the ambiance, it's the experience, it's the setting. And if you're going to eat Italian food, you want to feel like I'm in Italy or something. You, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of decor that goes with that experience. If you're going to eat Chinese, you know, you've, that, there's things that go with that. And so the people in the restaurant business are out there trying to appeal to everybody out there, and they're competing for business based upon people's per personal preferences. Because I don't have to go to a particular restaurant. They're going to have to, they're going to, have to get me in there based on my appealing to my desires. Think about this. Isn't this a pretty good picture? Yeah. And, of course, you've got other places that are like cafeteria. We've got something for everybody. You know, we've got this for that. And if you don't like this, well, just, you know, fine. We've got plenty more here. Uh, and then you've got some that are really, really high brow. They're snooty. You know, they appeal to the, you know. And only, you're, you've got to have a, you know, Madison Avenue something or other to even think about going there. And, you know, we're going to serve you the finest and our waiters and waitresses, if they even have, probably waiters in a place like that, are just going to be so prim and proper and we just, everything is just going to be so, just so. But every, you think every one of these things and a million other variations are doing, are doing what? They're appealing to people's personal tastes. So what's driving all of this? What, who's in charge of this system when you really get down to it? The customer. The customer is king. But we've got a religious system where the customer is king. And so you can look at huge congregations that give this incredible appearance of of religious spiritual success. Man, they can draw the crowds. There's excitement. There's a, there's, they got the ambiance to go with, you know, the, the full-blown religious experience. And you listen to their message. I'll tell you what it doesn't ever address. Itself. It's the self, independent self-will is never challenged. It's make people feel good. Give them what they want. I define what I want to hear. Oh my God. Just think about all of this. Because there's an appeal. 
I tell you, you can get out there and you can see all kinds of things that look good. If we had persecution break out in this country, what do you think would happen to the visible church? You think it would all rise up and be a mighty fortress for our God? No, they'd run for the hills. And I'll tell you, there's another trend that is so obvious and it doesn't always involve bad people. And that's making rock stars almost out of religious personalities. Could be singers. Could be speakers. Could be a preacher with a particular gift. And, you know, he might even be a real man of God in some cases. But I tell you, there's a generation that makes rock stars out of them. They'll run after it. Oh, man, wasn't that great? Let me show you that in the scriptures. Turn to Ezekiel 33. Interesting scripture. You know, we need to understand the world we live in and what drives it. So I believe God wants to sharpen our, our thinking and help us to understand what, what's going on. Because what I'm describing is the spirit of Babylon. It's the same spirit that drove Lucifer to do what he did, and it's running right into the church and beginning to drive it so that people are appealing. They're afraid to preach the truth. They're afraid to preach that people need to die to self, give up their lives and follow Jesus. They're afraid to lift up the blood of Jesus and all, of the, all those old-fashioned things. I'll tell you, they want the seeker-friendly church. Let's just get them in here. Let's seminar them into, into the gospel. We're going to have a little program and, 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 you know, on day seven. Oh, yeah, well, let's take care of getting them saved. Okay, believe in Jesus. I'm not exaggerating very much. I've seen stuff like that, just about like that. I may be, you know, characterizing. I mean, I may be saying it in words that they wouldn't say. But I'll tell you that we've got a gospel out there that's just accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Can anybody show me that in the Bible? That does not exist. You repent toward God. You put your faith in Jesus Christ as the only uh, sacrifice for your sins. You bow to him as Lord. And he'll save you. But this idea of just accepting Jesus. Man, they've got a religion that will make you, that will damn you to hell. You know, I read an article by my brother-in-law that was written 20 years ago, and he made a statement about, some, about this compromised gospel, and I, I agree with it. I, and he said, basically, it damns the sinners it promises to save and corrupts the church it hopes to build. Man, does that say it straight? The devil has tricked people in, into trying to make a show in the flesh. Yeah. Oh God, you know, the measure of success is people and activity and, and the appearance of really having something. And so the gospel gets soft peddled and we're going to appeal to people's natural desires. You can fill stadiums if you'll tell people you're going to give them the secret to success in life. Yes. Tell them God loves them. He wants them to have all the good things of life. And go to heaven at the end. It's a false gospel, folks. And God is calling a people to stand for the truth in the midst of a great falling away. You know, Ron read that scripture last night. There is a period, there's an apostasy, and I believe we're in it. We're seeing it. It's running from the truth, and it's embracing in the name of Jesus Christ, a spirit of rebellion. Amen. It's about me and what I want. I'm in charge. Nobody can tell me what to do. I am an independent soul just looking to Jesus. Oh, God, help us to get free Amen. from the influence of that. But listen, I started to take you to Ezekiel, didn't I? Let's go there. Ezekiel was a prophet, just in brief, 
He was carried away when, the, uh, when Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar in the first wave. They took Daniel and some others. They took a lot, of, a lot of the best of the people and carried them off to Babylon and settled them in communities, most of them. And this was a guy, Ezekiel, was settled in one of the communities of Jews living in Babylon. And God began to use him as a mighty prophet and actually carried him in the spirit several times back to Jerusalem, showed him the wickedness. He prophesied of what was coming, that, God, that greater and greater judgment was coming. Because he saw the wicked people in Jerusalem actually practicing idolatry in God's temple. God was through with it. So this was a man who had, had a, a tremendous prophetic ministry that was really hard-hitting and straight. So just because somebody preaches the truth doesn't mean that everybody who rallies around them is walking in it. That's why I say there's a rock star mentality sometimes. Look at verse 30. As for you, son of man, your countrymen are talking together about you by the walls and at the door, doors of the houses, saying to each other, come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouths they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words but do not put them into practice." Can you see that kind of thing as you look around? See, there's a lot of false prophets out there. You've got, you got some people who know the Lord. They're mixed up in this system. We do have some brothers and sisters. And it's not the people that I'm so interested in, I mean, uh, that I'm you know, trying to expose so much as the Spirit. It is the system that God wants to get us, get out of us. You know, the problem with the Israelites was not getting them out of Egypt. It was getting Egypt out of them. Because they kept going right back. I mean, you take them down centuries later, when, uh, was it Jeroboam re rebelled against the house of Solomon after Solomon died? He took the ten tribes and they went off. What did he do? What's the first thing he did? Anybody remember what he did? He set up two golden calves. I mean, you go right back to the very thing that they had problem with in the, in the wilderness. Said, you know, look, we've rebelled against Jerusalem. We can't very well go down there and worship. We're going to establish our own little center of worship. Oh, I'll tell you what. Jesus Christ has promised to build his church. I want to be part of that. I haven't got the, I, I'm not smart enough. I'm not gifted enough. I don't have what it takes to try to, I mean, even if I could build something religious, what would it be? Can I build a little religious playhouse and say, God, come bless my... You know, my sister was involved with a church several years ago that latched on to one of these great church building schemes. And all of a sudden, she saw it change. And they were so busy trying to entice people to come there by making it friendly. I mean, not friendly in the sense that, you know, you're... Hi there, how are you doing? I mean in terms of, we're not going to talk about the hard stuff. We're just going to talk about, we're going to prophesy smooth things. We're going to appeal to people's desires to have a better life. We'll get them in there and then we'll begin to teach them about Jesus. And then, you know, somewhere along the line, we're going to get them to sign on the dotted line and accept Jesus and that'll be all, that's all there is to it. We have got a church world that is full of lost people that have never, ever bowed before Jesus as Lord. And we need to stand up and tell the truth. I thank God for every one that the Lord saves in spite of that. Thank God, he's not done. But I'll tell you, this is, not, this is the interesting picture here. I mean, you've got people that sing for the Lord, and they'd, rah, rah, you know, they've got this big crowds just a hooping and hollering. How many of them do you really think know the Lord? And you watch, if you followed their lives, would they be sold out to Jesus? You know, Jimmy, I remember when you and I and some others went to that uh, 
coffee house so many years ago? Yeah. I've never forgotten that. Yeah. I can some of the Jesus people, I mean, not all of them were bad by any means, but this, whatever it was, we, we went there anyway, and we were going to sing, we took a group and sang there, and, and uh, you yeah, know, they were polite, I, I think they were received us politely, but I'll tell you, as soon as we got down, they had what they call a Christian rock group get up, you don't remember that? Well, I, I never forget it. And they just, you could not distinguish that from the rock music of the world, except if you listen real close, you caught some gospel words put to it. But everything about it was designed to appeal to a generation that loved rock music. They say, well, if we just change the words, it'll be great. We'll draw them in there, we'll get them in for Jesus. I'll tell you, we don't need to compromise the gospel. We don't need to compromise anything. We're not out for crowds. We're not in the restaurant business. We're not trying to compete with a different menu to see if, how, who we can entice. We're not trying to compete with churches down the street or anywhere else. We have one job. That job is to give out the living bread of life, to have God work through us because we have no power to do anything. I don't care what we build. If it's us doing it, it will fall. It will be worthless. But to the extent that we can be instruments of his word, his will, his purpose, I'll tell you, we're going to see something that will last forever. And that's what I, I just sense the burden of the Lord to, to cause us to understand where we're at, understand what's going on. You know, we've had some that have been pulled, and I've, I'll say with others, I'm just praying that God will open eyes to see what's going on. Because there's plenty of religious experience out there that can have you going home saying, boy, that was great, I felt good, the music was this, and the, the message felt, made me feel real cool and real good. But did it ever challenge self? I'll tell you what happens. The thrill might wear off, and then what happens? Then what do you do if you're, you know, you go into something like that? Well, you go find someplace else. See, that's the individualism of it. You're in charge. If I don't like one restaurant, if I find a bug in my soup that isn't supposed to be there, I'm perfectly free to take my act on the road. But that's what you got. Is that what is, is acceptable to Jesus? Is he going to come for that kind of a church? No. Something has got to change. Is that God's vision? No. no, there's something that is beyond our power to imagine that he has in mind. And I just, I struggle against unbelief myself in this area. But I'll tell you, we're going to have to go by this book. Yes. You know, I mentioned the question of authority, individualism, I'm the authority. And then you do have this tyranny, it exists in religion too, in some cases, where people just abandon their authority. It's all about, you know, I just, uh, I don't know, and so-and-so seems to, so I'm just going to blindly put my faith in them. That's not God. That's not what God's after. God is not after either individual self-will, nor is he after tyranny in any form. What he is after is bringing us under divine authority. Amen. I tell you, when we're under his loving authority, that makes all the difference. Man, I want, I want him. My life is not my own to do as I please. I don't have the right to just to go and do. The religious system will never come to grips with what is really wrong with people. It's the sin of rebellion and individual, you know, individual self-will. It never really comes to grips with that. God has a better way. God has a vision of what he has done in his church. You can see it in the beginning. And this has been alluded to. When God anointed Peter to preach that powerful message, lifting up who Jesus was, pointing to the responsibility of those that had crucified the very one God had sent. 
their hearts were pricked. What happened? They were baptized. They repented. They turned to God with all their hearts. What happened as a result of that? What was the promise? They'd be filled with God's Spirit. See, the same Spirit that came down upon the disciples was the Spirit of Jesus. That same Spirit entered into these people. That's what made them a people. It was a people who shared the same Spirit. It wasn't a matter of, uh, well, I'm a Methodist or I'm a Baptist or I'm, you know, one of these brands. It was a matter of, Jesus lives in me. I am connected. God connected me. I didn't do this. When I, when I surrendered my life to Him, God connected me with everybody else that is born of that Spirit. And so they all just got on their horses and rode off in a million directions and followed Jesus in the sky. No. There was a practical unity of walking together, of caring for one another, of meeting together, of praying for one another, meeting one another's needs. There, it, meant, it, was, it happened on a real practical level. It was not some mystical something. You know, you talk to people and you say, oh, the body of Christ. The body. Yeah, the, I believe in the body of Christ. It's everywhere. Well, when it's everywhere, it's nowhere. It's like Brother Thomas used to talk about being married to the American wife. Where is she? You know, <laughs> she can't cook your, cook your uh, eggs and bacon or whatever. And I'll tell you what, there is something that is real and practical that God has established as a context in which to fulfill his purpose in our lives. And it is to make us one with each other. Amen. Praise God. Just uh, look at some scriptures. I've looked at, I've used some recently, but let's go to a different one in First Peter. Because it says the same thing, different author. Let me just read a, a quickly a passage. I think I've got enough time here. There's things I want to get to. But uh, in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, let's just begin in verse 7. He says, the end of all things is near. Interesting statement. We surely is, it's a lot nearer now, isn't it? This was written a long time ago. He says, therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Folks, we have no business being careless in this hour. You just try to drift along and you're going to drift right into Satan's net and find yourself in a bad place. We're going to have to be alive, awake, aware of what God is doing and saying. God has given us everything that we need to stand before him in glory one day and to, to see the fulfillment of these wonderful songs that were sung tonight. They're coming. That's in our future. Praise God. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Folks, we are so picky about the little faults that we have. God is so wise. He puts us together with other people who, are, who have faults. <laughs> of course, he put you there too. Where do we come off getting all, getting all bent out of shape about things that are, that are wrong that God's working on? God, give us a compassion for one another. God, shut up our gossipy tongues when that's needed. God, help us to do what he says here. Now, I'm, if there's something really that needs attention, needs dealing, that's a different story. But I'm talking about the, just the faults that we have. Put up with each other for crying out loud. That's the thing. You, go, you have restaurant religion, you just look, you get tired of that, you just go down the street. There ain't no other street, folks. If we're going to walk with God and God's people, we're going to have to be willing to stay the course and put up with each other while God does the work that he can only do in that context. How else will you ever die? How else will you ever let go of self? God has a plan that's so much wiser than man and his ways. 
Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one of you. Now here's, here's another picture that kind of parallels what Paul says in Ephesians 4. That's the scripture we use so much. About how every part contributes to the whole and it's a body. You've got the sense of, of, of people that are vitally connected. Yes. Members of the body don't just pick up and say, well, I'm going here today, you go there. Uh, you're, you would have a rough time if your body decided to do that. You're, the parts of your body. If they truly exercised an independence... That's not God's plan. God puts us together. Amen. He does it. It's the way it pleases Him. It's not according to our ambitions and our ideas. We surrender those. We say, Lord, I'm yours. You're the potter. I'm the clay. Just put me where you want me. Empower me to, to do whatever. But this is, this is the same principle here. It says, each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to do what? To serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Praise God. You know, it's like the parts of the body. You know, what, what, would, what would be the case if somebody said, well, I ain't going to do that. I'm just going to pinch it off. Everything south of that would suffer, wouldn't it? God has, has fixed it to where life his life, his grace, his all that we need to be what God wants us to be. It flows through one another. That means you've got something that I need. You're just as much a minister as I am. Because God's grace takes different forms, doesn't it? You can't put everything in one, in one category. Everybody has the, has the ability and the responsibility to yield themselves to God, to grow in Him, and to express His life one to another in, in a way that will cause the whole to build up Amen. and become what God intended. If any, and so he gives examples here. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. That ought to make us think and pray and say, oh God, I can't do that. Oh God, just, you're going to have to help us. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Simple picture, isn't it? But everywhere you've got this sense in the purpose of God of being built together. I'll save, I'll save one thing here for a bit. I want to read the scripture because I, I pose the question about authority. Where does authority lie? It do, you know, it, we, we already said it doesn't lie with you being the highest authority. Nor, does it, uh, nor is it others, other human beings who have this dictatorial power over you. Neither one of those is of God. But let's look at the picture that we've seen before, I think, in, in chapter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. Now, that right there, that tells you something. Here is the Apostle Peter. The fellow who was used of God on the day of Pentecost in the launching of the church. This is somebody high in the kingdom of God as we would see such things. And he's writing to elders. He says, I appeal to you. I don't command you. I appeal to you as my underlings. No, as my fellow elders. You see the spirit? See the spirit of it. Just hold this for a second and, and I'll refresh your uh, scripture that you know uh, in Luke chapter 22. Keep your finger in the other place. Because Jesus talked about this question of authority. Verse 24 of Luke 22, there was a dispute. Let's, they, argue, they got an argument. These wonderful apostles to be, apostles in making, they got in a fight. And the subject of their fight was who's going to be the greatest? Real spiritual stuff. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles Lord it over them. Now you got dominion authority pictured there. This is the way 
society works. It certainly did in that instance. The kings lord it over them. I am in charge. I tell you what to do. And listen to this deceitful point he makes. It says, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. I'm just such a noble character. I'm telling you what to do because I'm, I love you so much. Give me a break. <laughs> People exercise power because they're in love with power. It's self. Either way, it's self on the throne. But here you've got people who acquire power. They use it to control others and then they lie to themselves. They say, I'm your benefactor. But listen to what Jesus says. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like one, like the youngest. And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You see the spirit. So even where people do have authority in the sense that they've got a higher position watching over others, it doesn't have anything to do with the type of authority that's exercised in this world. It doesn't mean there isn't authority now that needs to be respected. That principle still holds, but it is not a bunch of people asserting their will over somebody else and trying to bend them and make them bow and tell them to shut up and don't ask questions. That's not the kind of authority God is interested in. We don't want that. But listen to what he says. He appeals as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings back in Peter, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Praise God. So in Peter's mind, he's standing beside yes. these brothers. Yes. He's standing beside them. He said, brothers, I'm going to tell you some things, but I'll tell you one day you and we're all going to stand there in glory. This is what we're living for. This is what lies ahead for every one of us. But here's where we're at now. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Serving as overseers. So you've got, uh, you've got some that do have a responsibility to watch over others. If that gift, if that ability comes from God, it is that not to be respected as something that comes from God. Even if it's imperfect. You see, God's gonna, God uses the imperfections a lot of times to bring out rebellion, doesn't he? So be shepherds of God's flock. But he says, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. So you got this one possible, one possible problem here is somebody, they just don't want to do it. They're not really willing. But he says, you need to be willing. You need to do this willingly. This needs to, this needs to come from your heart, not because it's a duty. Okay. Not, but here's another problem uh, that, that can arise, and certainly you see this everywhere in religion. Not greedy for money. Oh, God, religion is big business. you got people who are living high on the hog, taking, taking money from widows to live high on the hog. God help. I, I wouldn't want to, I don't, I, I'm going to say I don't want to be there. I guess I will. On the day of judgment. To see what's going to happen to some people that are like that. Wow. Lord, Lord, didn't we do all that great stuff? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. The motivation is not for what we get. It's for what God gives us the ability to give. God takes care of needs. See, the whole point of God's economy is, is it's a giving economy. It's a giving spirit. But somehow within the context of that, everybody also receives. Praise God. And here's the other thing. Not lording it over those entrusted to you. And that's what Jesus had referred to earlier. Not lording it over. But being examples of to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, 
you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Amen. Young men, in the same way, and that's an interesting way to put it. He just doesn't say young men be submissive. Young men in the same way. What he's saying is that the office of an elder doing what they're doing, it's a submission. Far from lording it, it is an act of submission. It's an act of service. We're submitting to the will of God to, to act on behalf of the body. That's, that's got to be the motivation behind it. If it isn't, it's something that's not right. Something God's going to have to work on. But young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. But then he takes a step back and says, all of you, clothe all of you, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So you see the character of the kingdom that God is seeking to build. There isn't this, I don't agree with that, that kind of a spirit. Who are you? God, help us to have a spirit that reaches out to God with a humility and says, I could be wrong. Every one of us is capable of being deceived we don't know our own hearts. God, the people that are running around saying, I'm following Jesus. And it's just the vanity of their own mind in so many cases. God, help us. But you know, I think a lot of times we, we take a break right here. We close the thought, wrap it up, put it on the shelf and say, well, that's one thought. Let's start something different. Look what he says in verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore. Ooh, there's a pesky word. You better get it back off the shelf. We're not quite done with that thought here. We thought we were all wrapped up here with what we were supposed to be toward each other. Now we're, gonna, now we're just dealing with God. Get this. This is, not a, this is not a minor point. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand what's he saying he's saying this this body life this spirit of mutual submission mutual humility you're not just submitting to one another you're submitting to god you can't separate this you can't be out with your brother without being out with god that's a sobering thought. But isn't it the truth? Yes. Is that not what he's saying here? Yes. Why would he put the word therefore in there? It's, 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 you got to find out what it's there for. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. I'll tell you, there is a glory that is coming. In this world, there's something that God has purposed to accomplish in this world. And I'm, I'm, I'm stepping out here by faith because it sure doesn't look like it. You look at the religious mess, the confusion of this world today, and you say God's going to have something when he comes. But his word says he will. Amen. And I want to be one of those people that stands for that that points to that, that believes his promise. I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 3. I've used scriptures in here quite a bit lately, but there's one I've kept passing over because I didn't want to, you know, I had something else I was focused on. But listen to what Paul describes when he's talking about the unsearchable riches of Christ. That ought to encourage us right there. We got everything we need in him. This is not dependent, what God has purpose to do is not dependent on your ability or mine. It's dependent on him and his purpose. And he's got everything that's needed. But he says, and to, in verse 9, and to make plain, well, let me, let me back up. I'll, I'll start this, uh, verse 8. Although I am less 
than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me. Now, how did Paul get what he got? It was grace. Or what was given? Yeah, it was, it was given, but it was grace. There is a divine enablement. That's the same thing that saves every one of us. We're saved by God's enabling power. But in this case, it was a special ability given to him to expound this, to make it plain, to understand it. He was caught up, he says, in one place to the third heaven and heard things that were unlawful to, to say. To, God gave him deep revelation so he could share it with us. I believe God wants us to get some of these things. They are lost in a blizzard of feel-good religion in our day. But anyway, this grace is given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Now, listen to this statement. This is what I passed over. His intent, God's intention, this is what he wanted to do. This is why he did, why he's, uh, what his purpose is. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. God is setting up a demonstration. We are that demonstration. That demonstration is for the benefit of the powers and principalities that rule this world. God is saying, devil, I'm going to show you. You think you were so wise to set off on a course of self-will I'm going to show you what real wisdom is. It's not to be found in the, in the expression of independence and rebellion. It comes about by laying that down and becoming one with the people and drinking of my spirit and becoming like me. That's where wisdom lies, devil. I'm going to prove it to you. Not only that, I'm going to prove it to you in the world that you rule. That's the part that we miss. Can you imagine, like I said earlier, Jesus coming for, what, for this mess right now? I, I just, you know, part of it upsets me. The very idea. It's, it would be like Jesus saying to the devil, well, I give up. You win. You win. I set out to, to fulfill this grand ideal, but I can't pull it off. Got a bunch of people down there that just don't get it. They're, they're just insisting on, on being split and splintered and everybody doing their own thing. And, and they, they think, I, I guess I'm just going to have to throw up my hands, come in there and rapture them all out, take them to heaven anyway. So much for the demonstration. Think about that. Think about the implications of that. You know, we've already seen God miraculously bring forth a church that was filled with his power and his glory. Yes. It's not like it's never happened. But is that it? Yeah. And then we're going we're gonna to begin with a bang and end with a whimper? God has something better in mind. Amen. I don't know how. I don't know where. I can't figure out how. I could speculate on some of the factors that may, fa may come into play, persecution being one of them. But I'll tell you, we serve a God who could bring slaves out of the mightiest nation on the planet yes. with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm yes. with fury poured out. He can do what he wants to do. Amen. He can do what he wants to do. But listen to some of the expressions that are in this word. As I said recently, I'm not getting this from Sears and Roebuck catalog. Go back to, the, to chapter 4 and the order of, you know, getting the body in order and getting it functioning. And he, and, and he says, and he gives a time frame or, or a, a temporal element to these. He says, until we all reach unity in the faith 
and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That sounds like a glorious ideal. It's just totally impractical, isn't it? That ain't never going to happen. We better, get a, we better convene a conference here and try to get everybody together. You think that's going to do it? Jesus has promised to build his church. He is the only one that can do it. Our job is to listen to him. Our job is to recognize Jesus Christ as the head, the only head of this church. And his word and his promises are true. No matter how ridiculous they sound when you try to, try to compare them with what we see in the world. Do you believe God can actually pull it off? Yeah. You want to be part of it? Look at some other things. Look at chapter 5. Now this is where, by the way, look at verse 21. Same principle that Peter is talking about. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Does that sort of say the same thing? Connects our relationship with each other with our relationship with him? Submit. That doesn't mean get, get up on your hind legs and try to make somebody bow. There's a submission there. There's a humbleness of spirit. There's an I might be wrong kind of thing, but I want to have a, I'm more concerned with having a right spirit than being right. First place, I might not be right. I always got to consider that possibility. But now come down into verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a strong statement. Man, that's not lording it over anybody, is it? To make her, now, but see, now he's talking about the church. To, make, to do what? To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. Now, does that sound like ending with a whimper? Can you figure out how to do that? No, I can't either. But that's in the Word, folks. Are we going to believe this, or are we just going to believe what we see in, in the world? You know, the, the last, was it the last song that was about the bride, the bridegroom coming? Anybody remember what Revelation 19, I forget which verse, says, 8, 7, 8, somewhere along in there, talks about the marriage of the Lamb has come. And what? Her bride has done what? Made herself ready. You see, God's purpose is to do something that we have never seen before. Brother Thomas used to preach this a lot. And I know it's easy to look around and get filled with unbelief. And if you're looking at us, you've got plenty of reason to be, un be unbelieving. But God is wanting to challenge us to stand for something that is impossible. Except for one thing. Nothing's impossible with God. Listen to this part of it. Let's go back to a verse I've used quite a bit recently. It kind of, it, it just really filled out the sense of what, how we get there. Verse 20 of chapter 3, in, in Ephesians now, we're back in Ephesians. He's just talked about the, the immeasurable riches of Christ. All that there is that's available to us. Now, he says this, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So what's the key to all this? It's his power. What power is that now? 
Think about, the, think about Ephesians in the context and how Paul develops his thought. What power is that? That's the same power that brought Jesus from the dead. When all hell would have kept him there. It not only brought him out, it set him on a throne. It gave him authority over everything. That power. That power. The same power. Not just something like it. That power. Is it work? Where? Where? In us. That's the key, folks. That's what makes up the church. It's people who have been born of his spirit. He's not just out here giving us a religion to practice. He's in here. And he is at work. Folks, the key, to, the key to experiencing this is learning to trust and, and surrender to the power that is at work in us. God is going to challenge your self-life and mine. Probably done it today a few dozen times. He is going to challenge it. Now you can run if you want to, but God is going to look you in the eye and he's going to say, I've got to do something about this. And the glorious thing is, it, is that it's not, you've got to do something about this, it's you're going to have to let me do something about this. It's not your power, you can't fix it. Neither can I. But oh, we can let him have these areas of our lives that the devil so easily works on. You want to be free tonight, you give up what the devil uses to Christ. And you say, devil, it's not mine anymore. You're going to have to talk to the new owner. Thank you, Lord. You see the key? There's a power that's able to bring this off. It's able to do, and, and the thing is, we're not talking about something that's never happened. We're talking about something that did happen. So don't let the devil tell you this can never be. Yes, it can. I don't know how he's going to, all of how he's going to pull it off, but I'll tell you what, when he presents us to himself, we are going to be what he wants us to be. You think God's going to suddenly rapture a bunch of carnal Christians to heaven, if there is such a thing. And all of a sudden we're going to be radiant and free and glorious and all of that and they're going to sit down and have a bridal something or other. That's the picture that's painted. Most places. God is going to prove this and we're going to go back to what I said about this demonstration to the devil. See, that's a, that factors in here. God's going to prove to the devil that he can bring a people to this place where they're ready to go with him. They have overcome. Who is it that overcomes? He that's born of God. Where does the power come from? It comes from him. It comes from surrendering your life to him. That power works in us. We're able to overcome. We're able to stand in this hour. I tell you, he that, he that endures to the end, Jesus said, will be saved. Well, who are they? It's not people that stand in their own strength, not the religious. It's people who surrender their lives to Jesus Christ and put their faith in him. His power can make us all that he ever intended for us to be. But here's where we're at. We're in the process. God has put us in the crucible, if you will, of the body of Christ. He lets things happen. He lets offenses come. He lets you show yourself and all of us. He lets our warts come out. And we're going to have to have the grace of God to stand against the devil in every form, particularly to stand together against the devil, against the common enemy that we have, and say, we're going to go through we're going to see victory. We're going to see deliverances. God wants to do some things in our lives. How can we be useful to him if we're all fragmented and just living in our living careless lives? God is wanting us to have a vision, his vision. I'm not, am I making this up? This is in his word. This is God's heart. This is what he has for a people. Are we going to rise to the challenge? Not, not to say, yes, I can do it. But it's to say, Lord, I surrender to you. I can't do it, but you sure can. This is not self-effort. This is salvation. I'll tell you, there's going to be a glorious church on that day. It'll be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. That means God's got to get rid of some spots. 
and some wrinkles. Anybody here got any of those? Anybody not have them? Oh, we've got a God who's got a big iron. He might just use that person in the body of Christ that you just have the biggest, the hardest time with. But if you just humble yourself, under his mighty hand, God can take care of that wrinkle. He just might do something you didn't, you didn't expect. But the glorious thing is, it's, is what he says in, in, in verse 20 again. He is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Now, I've got a hard time imagining all this that I'm talking about tonight. Man, it ain't easy. Anybody here find it? Oh, yeah, I can, I can see that. I can just imagine that. It's like, like the children of Israel in Egypt. Free? What are you talking about? More bricks. Come on. I'll tell you what. God, the God who brought them out, the God who marched them into Canaan land, who toppled those walls of Jericho, that God is our God. Amen. And what he has purposed in this world, he, is, he has the power to make happen. If we will sign on, as it were, if we'll just commit ourselves to the thing. I'll give you just one scripture real quickly. I used this recently in Isaiah 62. Because it, it's another part uh, uh, that we play. And we we, we Play the part in that we understand what he wants to do. We cooperate with it. We believe it. But here's another part of it in Isaiah chapter 62 and verse, well, verse 6, I guess. I have posted watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. God give us the grace to not dumb the message down, but to proclaim what God's word says. Not to compromise the gospel. But to, not to try to appeal to the carnal desires of men, but to give out the word of God, knowing that the God of that word will cause the parts of some to receive it. Because all God's sheep all, will hear his voice. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the sheep. But then he says this, you who call on the Lord, give your, that's all of you now, if you call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. Now, it doesn't mean you don't sleep at night. Do you understand what he's saying? Don't quit. Give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of heaven, right? Well, wait a minute. Of the earth. You think just maybe God wants to do something here? Think about that. Give him no rest. God just wants to bug him about this. In a very, you understand what I'm saying. But, but till he establishes Jerusalem. Now he's not talking about the Jerusalem that now is, the earthly city. He's talking about what Paul says in, in Galatians chapter 4. There's a heavenly Jerusalem. That heavenly Jerusalem is the mother of us all. That's the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the one Abraham was looking for. It's real. Jesus Christ brought it to reality. There is a city that we have been made citizens of, but God is not just wanting to have a glorious city up there. We know it will be. You read the last two chapters of Revelation, and you see how glorious it's going to be. God is saying, I want it to be a praise here. Give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Praise God. I tell you, I'm just like you. I got a lot of unbelief to even stand up here and preach these things, but they're, they're in the word. What are we going to do with them? Well, one thing, we need to believe it. But you know, just believing it up here ain't going to get it. We need to have a heart that's committed to make it happen. To experience it. Not like we can engineer it, but I mean like we can say, oh God, make this happen. Make it real in me. Don't just fix everybody else up and I'll be fine. God, start here. Let me be one who comes into the light. So, like Carl read the other night, so it'll be evident that what I do is God's doing it. I'm doing it with his strength. 
I tell you, we got a God who is going to back up his word for people that dare to believe it. Amen. As impossible as it seems. But I want to tell you, your salvation is just as impossible as this. That's what Jesus said. And the disciples said, who then could be saved? He said, well, man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God can save you. He can do this. He can make us to be what he wants us to be in the earth. Let's not give him any rest. Let's sign on for the process and be part of it. Praise God.